Hello, welcome to the Deadly Analysis Podcast. What you're about to see is a roundtable discussion that we recorded about a month ago. Why so long, you ask? Well, the initial video was flagged for copyrighted material. See, to enhance your experience watching our analysis, we included clips from the film, just as nearly every film criticism channel does on YouTube. We talk a lot about cinematography in this episode, so it seemed best to let you see some of that cinematography. Yet, the international distributors of the film, MOS Film, M-O-S Film, led by Karin Shaknazarov, a Putin supporter and proponent of the Russian annexation of Crimea, objected to the use of a grand total of three minutes of clips in a two-hour video. We disputed the claim, and they rejected the dispute. Our understanding of these things is that the studio who owns the footage scrubs YouTube for any copyrighted content. Essentially, a bot figured out that we use the clips. And that studio chooses how to deal with content that's been flagged. It should be known that Mosfilm chose the cruelest options available to them. While the dispute was under review, they blocked the video in most countries. Then they rejected the dispute, even though it's a clear-cut case of fair use. Rather than continue to fight it, we have removed the clips and re-uploaded our discussion. We hope that you continue to enjoy our discussions and join us every Sunday for our roundtable talks. For our part, we'll probably avoid recommending any of Mosfilm's content for a while. Damn Russians, always meddling in things. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the Deadly Analysis podcast. Tonight I'm with Shayra and Ben, and we'll be discussing the 1985 war film Come and See. Directed by Elam Klimov and starring Alexei Kravchenko, the film follows a young boy who gets enlisted in the Soviet army as the Nazis are invading Belarus. He meets a young girl named Glasha, and after a brief sojourn with her, he witnesses atrocity after atrocity as the Germans brutally destroy his village. If you're new to this podcast, we'll be spoiling the film throughout our discussion, and it's go going to be wide-ranging. We'll talk about the film's depictions of war, its tonal shifts, and try to suss out the meaning behind its more metaphorical elements. This is a brutal, eye-searing film that's unflinching in its depictions of war. Now, for me, there are two general ways that a film can affect me. One is through its technical mastery or through my empathetic connection to its characters, the film that means something to me personally. Ben has talked about this when he's talked about his uh, love of The Seventh Seal. And I've talked about it when I talk about my love of Annihilation. Uh, the great ones for me are the films that are able to do both. Both empathetically connect with me and also uh, display a degree of technical mastery. And for me, what's really odd about Come and See is it's so technically brilliant that that it almost feels like it empathetically connects with me. It almost feels like this film does both, even though I can trace back the reasons why I like this film so much to its technical elements. Uh, this is masterful filmmaking by Elam Klimov with its use of singles, uh, POVs, tracking shots. We're going to get into all of the filmmaking. So... At least when I talk over the next couple hours, this might be a love fest for this movie. But let's see about my colleagues. Uh, what did you guys think of this movie? 628 villages burned in this way. Um, and knowing that it is true to stories told by survivors, it adds to the horror even more. Um, it's, it's just one of those things that sticks with you. I, it never goes away stays inside of you and you feel nothing but sadness and and horror thinking about it so 
uh, I had to I had to bring this up. I had to bring this uh, to to our show at some point. It's it's a hard one to get through though. There's a lot of triggering moments, so it's not something that I'm like, hey, let's start there, <laughs> you know. But uh, definitely something I thought that we needed to eventually discuss. Yeah, I mean, for me too. This was uh, this was definitely a tough one to watch, and I was mentioning this even just before uh, the podcast that after seeing the trailer. Um, it wasn't something that I initially really even wanted to dig into just because it, it just seemed so raw and so intense. Um, and you know, going into it that it's not going to be a happy movie. <laughs> like this isn't meant to be, um, something that's sort of like a feel good sort of like romper, like a comedy horror. It's not, it's not really a thriller that you can sort of like get into in that way and sort of get lost in the drama. It, what we're really looking at here is just this detailed examination of the atrocities of the Nazis in world war two. And they show it in such a way that doesn't glorify the violence of war. Um, and I think that's that's probably one of the greatest things about this is that it doesn't go down the same path that films like Patton might go down, for instance, where where you kind of have this this feeling that, you know, someone who goes into battle in this sort of like hardened way is more manly or like more tough and like something to be looked up to. No, when we get to the point where the the main character, F- Fiora, I guess, like I, I'm going to butcher the pronunciations. I'm not even going to try Like it's, it's going to be bad. Um, when we get to the final point where we sort of see the effects of the happenings of the movie on our main character, it's not something where he's come out of this like tempered and hardened and and sort of like battle ready and like heroic, I guess. Like he doesn't come off as like a heroic character. He's more, he's tragic. It's a tragic character. He's been like torn down and, and sort of like mentally ripped apart by this. And honestly, like one of the, one of the best things about it, I think is, is the character acting that we see in that where, you know, we, at the beginning of the movie, we see sort of like this innocence of childhood sort of devolve into this, this facially expressed, clear, um, just absolute. I, I can't even put words to it, just because it's so, it's so fucking, it, it's so intense. It, it seems so real. Whoever this actor was, like I, I, he does a fantastic job of depicting these real emotions. What I would imagine the atrocities of war would have on somebody who watches the things that he's watched. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. And so, again, like I, I, I guess I'll be echoing the sentiments of my my co-host here in that. It's not. Um, it, it's it's an absolutely tragic, horrific film, but as a, a f- someone who appreciates the technicality of film, it goes above and beyond. It's absolutely fantastic. Technically, the acting, just everything about it is just absolutely phenomenal. Alexi, I wanted to, uh, Alexi, sorry. Alexi, I'll just give him, I'll just give name credit to Alexei Kravchenko real quick, but go ahead, Shira. I was going to talk about him. Um, so interesting reasons why he may have depicted this so well uh is that they filmed this sequentially like it happens as they go along uh the first scene was the first filmed and the last scene is the last filmed but on top of that they used actual gunfire shooting above his head barely like near his head um and he was so stressed out by all the things that happened to him. By the way, this is an actual 15-year-old boy that is acting this out. All of these depictions, all of these scenes felt so real that he he actually did feel stress from making this film. He actually did experience these, these fears. Um, and according to uh, what the director said, the most uh, troublesome thing that the actor had to do was when he was inside of the barn and um, everybody's shoved in there and moving around and every one person's movement leads to everybody's movement, that claustrophobia, uh, the idea that y- you could easily die in this place um, with a bunch of people. And um, that was probably the hardest scene for the, for the boy to try to act out. Um, which is interesting because bullets flying over your head sounds much more horrific to me, but maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe there's different things that uh, make people uncomfortable. But um, I don't know. I, I, I do think he actually did get stressed. And the director said that he um, tried to have somebody hypnotize him. Uh, he did it for another film where there was a young person and they tried to hypnotize him to 
um, put them in a different mindset so they don't have to experience the stress of that role. Uh, but he was not hypnotizable. So uh, he did not get to have that treatment done because it didn't work on him. So he experienced it. And I think there was like a legend. I don't know if it's true or not, but that he his hair actually did turn gray from the filming of this. I don't know if he actually did, but that's part of the legend of this story. Man, you hear about people talking about how James Cameron is hard to work with. I feel like this takes it to a whole new level. You know what I mean? Like 1980s Russian directors. <laughs> right. They're shooting live ammunition at you in, in 1985 uh, Soviet. And actually, that's not new. In the, uh, in the early days of film, uh, they used live ammo on uh, sets with, with gunfire. Um, let's talk about this. I mean, we've we've talked about this how this is a horror film and I do want to kind of explore that idea with you guys. I mean, uh, is this a horror film? And if it is, are all war movies to some degree horror films, especially horror uh war films that have the thesis uh that war is hell so to speak and that I I mean would we call Saving Private Ryan a horror film? Would we call Schindler's List a horror film? Do we have more horror films to uh, to cover on our podcast if we could start opening up uh, all war movies to horror? Uh, what, do you, what do you guys think of the generic uh, elements of this movie? So my, my opinion is that I've watched a lot of war movies. I've watched a lot. I don't know why I'm into war movies. I don't know why that's a thing I do, but I, I do watch a lot of war movies. And um, some of them, when they're trying to talk about the war as hell, it almost feels um, like they're mocking it, like it's almost satirical, like they're trying to add comedy to it so that it's not as brutal on you, where they add glorification for certain situations where it should not be glorified this did not do any of the stuff that helps ease your pain through it it is 100 percent brutal the whole time there is no easing up even in moments of laughter it is pure hysteria and trauma related laughter that is occurring these people are experiencing the most horrific thing that could possibly happen to you your entire life, your entire family, your entire town is being brutalized and destroyed. The girl you love is being completely destroyed. Everything that could ever go wrong. And he's 15. There's nothing more horrific than that. And um, I'm sure that we could argue that there are a lot of war movies that have the horror elements. But there's always like this little added extra to make it not complete horror to me because even in in movies where oh uh we're shooting at the bad guys and then we end up in the same pit together and same foxhole we end up becoming friends like it doesn't have any of that shit there's none of that shit in this um there's no time for for happiness in this um so i don't know it's it's the complete loss of innocence. It's the complete loss of yourself. It is the complete loss of your childhood. It is the complete loss of your homeland. It is the complete loss of your family and friends. It is the biggest amount of loss I've ever seen. For me, I feel like this is a horror movie. I don't know that I would call all other war movies a horror like genre. Um, but I'm sure there are some things that I haven't seen yet. There, I, I haven't seen every war movie, so maybe there are some but I can't think of any off the top of my head like Saving Private Ryan yeah the beginning scene is is absolutely brutal but there's these moments of camaraderie and like we're doing a good deed and things are gonna be okay it's it, it takes away from what it actually is the horrors of it for me so and I know this is probably a personal subjective thing for me but I, it in my opinion this is one of the most horrific movies I've ever seen in my life so yeah, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, and like, you know, especially with like a lot of horror movies or a, a lot of war movies, rather. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't feel like they're really trying to to do horror. Um, they've got other elements in there, like you talked about, that are are more like, let's show the story of this hero who did this amazing thing. And you're supposed to feel something about that heroic figure. Um Whereas I think horror and it is it is pretty fluid, right? Because you can have you can have horror within most other genres you can have comedy horror you can have thriller horrors you can have science fiction horror you can have fantasy horror you can have drama horror 
Um, and I think really what makes the difference isn't it's obviously it's not the violence. Obviously it's not the tropes that we see in, maybe in movies like scary movie, although that definitely is kind of like a hat tip, right? Like whenever we see horror genre tropes, um, that I think is supposed to make us feel like, Oh, okay, clearly we're watching a horror film. But what really I think makes the difference is the application of fear. Um, so in this one in particular, I think, I think what the director is probably trying to do is to make us see the horrors of war for what they are without wrapping them up in any kind of like false heroism or any propaganda that we would typically see and make us afraid of that level of violence so that we can avoid it in the future. I think that's really what they're trying to do is they're trying to communicate this, this, the horrors of war, the horrific nature of war to instill a fear in us to make us more averse to violence and war. Um, and I think that's probably what would pro maybe qualify this as a horror film, though I suppose that probably is sort of like temporally relative too. Obviously, this is going to be sort of like time bound um, and what people respond to in terms of their their fears in a culture is going to change over time. But this one, in fact, it, it should probably be thought of maybe as like a little more timeless because these seem to be themes that are a little bit cyclical. Um, you know, we see fascism and extremism rising up and making people want to do terrible things and we sort of forget that fear. Whereas, you know, art like this can help us to remember, no, this is actually super messed up. You should be afraid of this. This isn't something to glorify. You shouldn't want this to happen. This is something to be afraid of. Yeah, I think you're I think you're hitting the nail on the head there, Ben, because it's for me, a lot of war movies can also sort of Venn diagram into the action genre. I mean, as I brought up uh, Saving Private Ryan, I, I did that sort of as a, a in order to frame the question and to answer my own question like an asshole. Um, I would say that, uh, that that opening sequence in Saving Private Ryan is more of an action sequence than is a horror sequence. What sets Come and See apart are the singles, the the moments when uh, Alexei Kravashenko's character Fiora is staring directly into the camera completely helpless and those expression on his face as horrified as it is you know paralyzed by fear those are the types of things there's no redemptive action arc you said that he's not a heroic figure and I'm interested in his character as a whole throughout the film now uh, he he undertakes multiple actions, multiple missions, so to speak, over the course of a movie. And in a typical war action movie, he would be successful or unsuccessful in those actions. In each of the these missions that he undertakes to feed the starving people, to go off and fight the Nazis, to, um, you know, all of these, these actions, all of them are thwarted or ineffectual. Like, he is always helpless in this thing he almost has no agency and this is a counter narrative to many of the other war war action movies that we see where our main character our protagonist has agency he attempts to it's almost always a he he attempts to um do a thing uh, he gets uh, he runs into to problems and conflicts and then eventually he is able to do that thing and turn the tide of the war. This is none of that is here. This film almost works as a counter narrative to, uh, to that. And I wonder if this perspective makes it a horror movie and whether this perspective um, and this protagonist uh, ends up being seen as a heroic character despite all of his failures. Um, like, what do you think of the perspective of this film and, the, and how that point gets made throughout the film? I would like to compare him to a final girl and less than a hero. Uh, and the reason being, think of uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and how she ends. Um, she gets away, she gets into the truck, 
but she's laughing maniacally. She has lost Spoilers, her mind. Texas Chainsaw. Sorry. <laughs> if you haven't seen that movie yet, holy crap. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> but I, I am presupposing the comments even before the comments. Yeah, comments. they're all mad at me now. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> oh my gosh, Shayra, I was going to watch that. But, but she ends in the situation of absolutely going mad. And you know that it's not that she survived or that she's a hero or that she's any better than anybody else. She is now going to live with this for the rest of her life. It'll be serious trauma. She could end up locked away somewhere because she can't cope with life anymore. It's not a happy ending. It is, I didn't die, but I am still a victim of this horrible, disgusting thing. And I probably will never, ever be able to delete it in any way shape or form and um the reason why i think that was told that way uh the director himself was a survivor from the battle of stalingrad he and his family were in stalingrad during that and um so part of what happened to him was his dad stayed behind to fight like a hero right but he was a little boy his mom was with him and his baby brother they get on this makeshift raft thing with other women and children, and they they light the fi- uh, light the water on fire so it's at boiling point when they're on this rickety raft, and the moms are putting blankets over their children and putting themselves over their children to make sure sparks don't hit them and make sure they don't get burnt and get them across the water safely. And, of course, because this director was a curious child, he kept trying to peek from over... Uh, from under the blanket to see and and he says he will never be able to erase that hell from his eyes seeing what was happening to all the people because of the fire and the and the trauma and the sadness and the fear that was on their faces so um he's experienced this stuff and he wanted to portray what it is to be a victim of these things does it make him a hero does it make him brave that he survived that stuff I, like it just makes him a victim really and um this like glorification of of making it to the end it doesn't make sense to me because we don't think about what happens afterwards it's kind of like with romance movies you know you have these like this couple and they kiss and and they're married and the end everything's that's not how life works they're gonna fight about stuff later on in the castle you know that they're arguing about stuff maybe he doesn't know how to like you know, get it up later on in life. I don't know. But they're going to have arguments. And it's the same thing with these survivor kind of storylines. We see them, oh, they made it. Everything's fine. No, it's not. It's not fine. They just went through trauma. There's stuff that's going to be forever with them. And um, so I think the story was really trying to put that forth. That being a victim is not necessarily winning. You just managed to not die. And that's about it. Does that make you brave? I don't know. Like, that's for some people to decide, I guess. But So Come and See is a two-hour final girl sequence, essentially. Um, yeah, then you brought up the idea of Fiora being a heroic character, not being a heroic character. Can you explore that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, for the same reasons, I think Cher is 100% right about this, is that the the feeling that I got is that this kid is just all all of these things are happening to this kid and he's trying to do the best he can to survive but that's essentially all that's happening here is that he seems to have survived until the end and he is fundamentally transformed or changed because of the things that he's had to survive and in fact i see that as being kind of like the major arc for him because at the beginning we see him being taken away from his family and he's taken to this camp and he's left behind he's not allowed to march with the other soldiers in fact One of the other soldiers uh, ends up getting his good boots and he takes the bad boots that are all torn up and shit because like he's he's just going to be left there. And that's curious. Right. So why did why did they make the decision to leave him specifically behind? He was the only one except for that that girl. Um, And I don't think she was part of the army. I'm not sure about like the origins of her character are kind of like mysterious and like not really well defined, I think. But he's left behind for some reason. And that question was sort of like. It's stuck in my head throughout the entire course of the movie, but finally by the end, yes, he's still called a newcomer, but then he is sort of like now a part of that marching army and allowed to come on and and do their thing because he's changed. 
what happens, what we see right before he goes with them is that he is filled with rage and fear. And he is essentially like ready at that point to take other people's lives, I think. And like he's shooting the picture of Hitler to show his his intense emotion. You know, he calls out that other guy for what he said whenever they burned the people in that church. He's he's completely ready now. He's totally destroyed on the inside and so filled with anger and fear that he is now capable of taking human life. And I think that's why they finally decided to take him along at the end, because at the beginning he didn't have that yet. He needed to have his innocence entirely destroyed before he would be useful as a soldier. Um, and I don't see that as really a heroic thing. That's not a heroic transformation. It's just, it's, it's his, it's his dismantling, right? His internal dismantling into this, this scared, angry, completely destroyed victim of war who is now ready to go and kill other people. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I've got to differ with you guys a little bit because for me, he is a heroic character, but only because to me, surviving is by itself a heroic act. Like anybody who's undergone any serious trauma, if you're still around, that's heroism. You made it. Um, and if you're able to tie your shoes after this, uh, I mean, if Fiora is able to tie his shoes after everything that happens in this movie to him and around him, then that to me is heroism. Being able to wake up the next day and not off yourself, that to me is is heroism. So, I, I mean, it's I think this film works as a as I said before, I think it works as a counter narrative to many of these other war films. I mean, you brought up Patton, Ben, I think that's a good comp. Um, obviously, Saving Private Ryan, which comes out well after uh, this movie, um, 14 years after this movie, if I'm right. Uh, that's that's a good comp. But then that but those films are are about heroic heroism in a typically masculine way. Um, I think this is heroism redefined as simply survival and i'm okay with a definition of heroism that is just simply you made it you you made it to the end of the movie and you're maybe gonna go off and and kill more people but you made it to the end of the movie that's heroism at least for me now i understand that 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 the stripping of innocence and how he is changed to the point where he is no longer the innocent person that he was at the beginning, I get that as a down arc. And I certainly know, I certainly believe that he is worse off having undergone these things. Um, but nevertheless, I go back to the very idea that if, if he doesn't off himself at the end of this movie, if he's not turning the gun on himself instead of, uh, on the picture of Hitler, um, that is that is to my mind a sense of heroism. And even if he, even if he would turn the gun on himself, I would even be able to make an argument that that's heroism as well. I mean, for for me, it's just living through all this shit that makes it heroic to some degree. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's my my sort of. Camera. I I actually agree with you in a in a, a sense of in real world events that being a survivor is definitely heroic. Um, I, I would think I was more so thinking of like Hercules or <laughs> like the right, general, right. Uh, you know, like I how stories this, do it. Well, so. this movie is running exactly counter to Hercules and all of those other narratives. I think it's trying to redefine heroism to be that, you, you know, the, the idea that you and I just articulated, if you just survive, that's a heroic. Um, but you're right that this is not heroic in the traditional masculine sense of the word. When we're talking about Fiora's character and um, one of the major themes throughout this movie, I think, is uh, especially as it's in relation to its depiction of war is war renders people helpless. Um, and I think that's why many of Fiora's um, uh, enterprises don't work out because he's completely helpless in this situation. This is a situation that is bigger than he is. And I think this is demonstrated um, in the initial gun battles when we see and hear the bullets without actually seeing the shooters. And 
then later we actually see the shooters and i i'm wondering I, for me, the scenes in which we don't even see the shooters was far more effective and horrifying than the scenes in which we actually saw the laughing Nazis shooting up a barn or shooting other people. Like, what, what's, what was your point of view of that? How did you respond to those, those scenes? And what overall, like, what do you think of the theme of helplessness as it relates to this film's depiction of war? Yeah, helplessness is all over this film. And um, I think that is, so it, we've talked about the kinds of films that tend to make me get really afraid and really scared. It's where your agency is taken away, pod people taking your brain and taking over your body, or or you just aren't able to be yourself. Uh, this is that exact same kind of fear, but it's the realistic version of it, right? You have no way of controlling the situation. You are trapped you are unable to uh, even try to reason with anybody around you. Um, all you can do is just hope that a bullet doesn't hit you or hope that you won't be blown up in a barn or whatever the heck is going on. Uh, or in real life, when they were filming this, uh, one of the problems was that the cow actually fell over on the director and other people and they all got seriously injured. Um, so that was an actual scary thing that happened to some of the people involved. Um, but like that idea of helplessness is all throughout and it's a lack of control that is really horrifying to a lot of us. Uh, we talk about free will and determinism all the time in philosophy, but I think this is a, a, along the lines of the same type of thing. Like you are trapped essentially. And I think being trapped is the ultimate fear. And like, I I've experienced being trapped. I've been sick to the point where I have to be trapped in a bed for two months straight. That is a very horrific thing. A lot of people don't think about how that messes with you, but it does. And it's, it's, um, it's psychological warfare. It's a psychological thriller. That's what this film is. It, it shows what happens to you in your mind when you have no control over anything and you never know what's going to happen next. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's absolutely the theme. I think that that's what it's trying to discuss, as well as warn us of how we get to that point. When we let dictators take over, when we let hate take over, when we allow these certain ideas to permeate within our society and to get to a point where we can justify hurting and harming others based off of where they are born uh, and treat them as if they are less than, um, those people can be in a very precarious situation after that. And... We need to be wary of that, and we need to understand that we shouldn't put people in that situation. It's not right. It's evil. Well, the I mean, that's what you're what you're talking about is sort of the rhetorical dehumanization of the enemy, which often takes place in war movies and even in war rhetoric. I mean, uh, we call p civilians who are killed uh, accidentally as collateral damage. We, you know. We we often dehumanize the enemy either with racial epithets or with uh, rhetorically. In, in some way, we try to rhetorically create them as non-human, and this happens. We see this all over the movie. I mean, we see it at the beginning when the uh, Russian commissar is or Soviet commissar is talking about how. Um, you know, the, the Nazis are, are evil, which of course they are. I mean, this is, it's, it's, uh, visually represented later in the film when the Nazis actually show up. But I let, let's talk about the philosophy and the ethics of rhetorically dehumanizing the enemy. I mean, this is something that you touched on Shaver when you were talking about other war movies and how, uh, you know, two guys are in a, a in a situation together and it's stuck in a foxhole and later they recognize each other's mutual humanity. This is a movie that does the opposite of that. This is a movie that suggests that uh, the Nazis are inhuman and then they turn out to be inhuman uh, in their, in their brutality. And I, is that, I mean, certainly we're not going to get on a, a, a place of talking about the humanity of some of the characters shown in this film, because clearly they're, they do inhuman things. But I wonder about the ethics of uh, dehumanizing the other. 
Uh, what, what do you guys think? I, like, is that ethical? Like, what do you think about that, especially as it relates to a film that is clearly dehumanizing the other? Dehumanizing the other? I, I think that they tackle that at the end uh, when they have a bunch of people rounded up under that bridge um, and they're discussing what their crimes are. And it's it's kind of like a um, you know a mob mentality because it's a bunch of people that are like here we are the judge jury and executioner like what tell us about your crimes what did you do what did you say why do you do these things um, and I think it does show that even when we see that they've done some horrible things that they can be human too you could see the fear on their face. Uh, you could see how they were like, no, he, he was in charge. He told us to do this. It wasn't me. He was the guy who told me to do this stuff. And this is what happened in the Nuremberg trials. Uh, we see a ton of people saying like, whoa, hey, if it were me, I wouldn't have done this. But, you know, I had been told to do this and now I'm doing it. And so um, it, 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 it once again goes into agency and helplessness. Can you just say no to those people that are telling you to do that atrocious thing? Are you still a criminal? And we determined, yes, you are. <laughs> Absolutely, you are still a criminal. You did the crime. Uh, you're not supposed to do these things. Um, but, I mean, that's still a question that people like to ask. Can you then point to the person who's in charge and be like, I wasn't responsible, it was them. They, they were the ones that did this. Um, and when one of the characters was talking about their reasoning for doing what they're doing, uh, he stated that their reason had to do with the fact that they are subhuman. They are not a race that deserves to live. And then when they were like mad at him and like, whoa, how can you say that? He's like, those aren't my words. Somebody else said it. I'm just telling you what he said. It's like, whoa, dude, like... Do you have any agency? Do you have any responsibility? Do you have any control over your own actions? Um, so it, there was a definite moment in the film where they didn't want to just be like, oh, yeah, all Nazis bad, but, 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 but. They wanted to discuss why anyone might turn into a monster like that. Why anyone, any of us could be that guy. We all could possibly do these horrible things. And none of us are above that reproach. So, um, I don't know. I think it did a good job of discussing uh, nuance, I guess you could say, in that realm. Yeah, it goes to the uh, Hannah Arendt, the banality of evil. But go ahead, Ben. You wanted to jump in there, on this. There's a couple things there. So, I, I, I do see what you're saying about the dangers of dehumanization. And as a general rule, I 100% agree with that, right? We... <clears throat> um, it's it's absolutely dangerous and propagandistic to say, well, this other, the other, the enemy, they're less than human. They're just this entity that deserves to kind of like be attacked. And, you know, we need to demonize them and like completely take away the understanding that these are people that are doing these atrocious actions. Um, and I think in this film, the reason that we have that that sense so strongly is because of the use of kind of like subjectivism and just like the, the perspective and the way things are shot. <clears throat> and I think this this point is actually I, I didn't really fully grasp this until I watched this other review for the movie that Sherry you shared. Um, and I, I don't remember exactly like the name of the channel, but I think this was a fantastic point that, you know, in the Criswell. shots. That... OK, it's thank you. Uh, Chris Wells channel. Uh, he does a quick uh, 15 minute on this thing. So go gotcha. ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So this was absolutely fascinating because like throughout, I think, the course of this movie, the way that it's shot um, we're, we're meant to hear the things that the, the main character is, is like emphasizing in his own psychology. We're sort of seeing things from his perspective. <clears throat> and of course, that's bent in a couple of different ways and really interesting ways in terms of like the lines of perspective and so on and so forth. But in his mind, throughout the course of this movie, of course, he's going to see these the Nazis as absolute monsters, right? <clears throat> and like their reactions and their actions are going to be emphasized to the point of seeming inhuman because the things that they're doing are inhuman and monstrous. And I think that's that's what we're really trying to emphasize in the way that those perspectives are are sort of drawn out and like how our main character sees this. That's that's sort of the point of doing it this way. 
But that scene share that you mentioned at the very end is also really integral into sort of like tying together this narrative that no, these are just humans because like you actually see that this person has a rationale they're explaining in the way that they've been taught and what they've learned is that they had to destroy and, and this is going to get super dark. Just I'm, I'm going to explain expe- specifically what was going on in this scene is he he wanted to keep anyone that had children in this church and make sure that they got burned because the issue starts with the children because they are taught this certain way of living. And what they were really trying to stem is that they didn't want this communism in their words to spread because it was like an ideological plague essentially that starts through the, 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 the education of children. And so like they needed to make sure to snuff that out because that's what they were trying to, to eliminate was the spread of this communist ideology or something like that. And he had a rationale for it and it's clear that that's kind of like the way it was explained to him and what he was taught. And like, he's essentially fulfilling this duty to serve this greater good in his mind to preserve a certain way of life and eliminate a way of life that's toxic to, to other people because they're taught that at at childhood. Right. And obviously that's really super fucked up. That's really messed up and horrible. And he was essentially like radicalized and made, made kind of like an extremist through obviously like the, the, the culture, the Nazi culture and like, you know, everything that they had, like all the propaganda and like teaching people that this is something that needed to be snuffed out for the greater good. Um, but you can see that this is a person with a logic and a rationale explaining why they're doing these things. And of course that sort of contrasts with the image that you have of this female SS officer or something like that, sitting in a car and eating crawfish or something like that while these people are being burned. Right. So, I mean, it's like, there's still this clear distinction being made that yes, these are humans, but they are humans who have become monsters because what they're doing is truly monstrous and horrific, but it's because of this thing. So yes, we have that sort of subjective viewpoint that dehumanizes them, but also a key scene toward the end that really ties together that no, these are just people that have been radicalized and given extremist viewpoints and taught to do terrible things and are probably also a product of in some ways of their environment and that goes back to the responsibility that you were talking about and i think in the nuremberg trials the way it it turned out was that it was primarily the officers that were charged i think because because of that authority that they had to make their sort of like their people do what they they wanted them to do Um, And this really sort of goes back to an interesting experiment, too. I think it was like Stanley Milgram at Harvard who did these authoritarianism experience where you can actually cause people in 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 a laboratory setting to deliver electric shocks to another person who seems to be having heart problems because the person in the lab standing next to them in their lab coat is telling them to do that and the responsibility is deferred. So you can produce this result in other people that as long as they feel like they're being told to by an authority figure, they're going to acquiesce to those requests to do these horrible things to another human being it's just something in our psychology i guess that does that um i'm not sure if it's a justification or not but it definitely sort of teaches you that we have these these buttons and these levers inside of us that can be manipulated to get people to do horrible horrific things if you play on those just right and i think that's probably something that that hitler and and his sort of like um key officers were clearly able to do very well is radicalize people and make them hate others and become monsters um and treat them in this sort of like unhuman way that you you wouldn't think that other people would ever be able to do to someone the entire inciting incident i'm speaking in film theory when i'm talking about real people uh that's how you know you're a film critic the inciting incident for the milgram experiment was how do you get somebody to become a nazi death camp guard And uh, Milgram found out that all you have to do is tell them to be a Nazi death camp guard and they will. Um, And I think but let's let's go back to the two scene, uh, one scene that you guys were mentioning. And I want to take a little bit of a deep dive into that scene because I think that's interesting. You have a collection of Nazis there and one person is saying all races do not. This is a quote. All races do not get to go on. And that was the the person, the radicalized person that you were referencing, Ben. Um, you've got another guy there who 
is doing the translation, he's obviously trying to pass the buck. He's saying, it's not me, it's them, it's not me, I was told, blah, blah, blah. He's doing the old uh, transfer of responsibility. And then you've got a bunch of other people there who are sort of uh, on the the same wavelength or on, on a similar spectrum as that guy saying, it's not me, it's someone else, it's blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think there was only one guy there who was really taking agency for the actions. Everybody else was passing the agency along. And I think that when we're talking about this this film's dehumanization or otherization of the Nazis, um, as it, you know, as it right, I'm not sticking up for Nazis, uh, as it rightly dehumanizes these people, um, I think that uh, it's interesting that it is that 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 it it is careful enough to um, to differentiate between the truly radicalized people and those those who are kind of just following along. There's even a a shot, and it's a brief second, and uh, I I'm not even sure. I had to sort of go back and pause to make sure. Uh, that I was seeing what I thought I was seeing. But as they're shooting the barn, um, you've got a bunch of people who are laughing and having a grand old time at, at, at murder and genocide. But then you've got this one guy with glasses who's sort of, he's, the expression on his face is clearly fear. And he doesn't want to go along with this. And he's sort of struggling with his glasses as he's trying to fire this gun. And uh, I thought that that was a brief moment of individualization of these characters. Um, it seems to me that in real life, as the military tries to dehumanize the enemy, it's something that's worth resisting. But it's it's we do we do that at our own peril because in wartime there actually are sometimes monsters, um, and that not all. Uh, monsterfication of the other, I'm making up words, um, is is unjustified. And I think this film is, that's that's the heart of what this film is saying about the dehumanization, dehumanization of the enemy, at least to my reading. So, um, yeah, I think I think where they really uh, showed that they were monsters, uh, definitely the eating of the uh, crawdad or lobster or whatever that was that she was suckling on while people are dying and burning and screaming. Uh, I think that's one way of, of showing it. But the other way was having the guy peek his window in or peek into the window. And he said, uh, yeah, you guys can leave, come out the window, uh, but leave your kids behind. And there was like a pause and they were like, is this motherfucker for real and then a woman yells out you beast like you are telling us to kill our children if we want to survive who does that who the hell does that and so um nazis that's nazis that nazis and I'm and then like it, and then it escalates to for me the the thing that made me almost pee my own pants where he decides, our, our main character, Fleora, he comes out the window. He decides to go out the window. I mean, none of those are his kids, and it's not really, you know, his people. His people had already been slaughtered. Uh, he goes out the window, and then he has to watch all this atrocity going on around him. And then, after, ah, gosh, what is it, like five minutes of brutality going on around him? These Nazis come up, stick a gun to his head, and a guy with a camera struggles with his camera trying to get a good shot of them standing together like friends with the gun to this kid's head. And they take the picture, and then they all just walk away, and Fleora just falls to the ground just defeated. He's he's seen as a corpse. Uh, later on, like, they, it goes a couple of minutes of more horror and then later on a guy is riding by and he kicks him like a corpse and like ah oh, he's dead because <laughs> he just kept laying there like I'm fucking done i i can't i can't even and that shot and i know i see everybody uses that shot for this film because it is a very powerful shot he thinks he's dead 
he thinks this is it. But they were using him as a prop for a photo. Like, I, I don't know. It's it's one of the most fucked up scenes I've seen in a movie ever. And it really hit me hard. I was scared for him. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, this is... Uh, and then and then when they walk away, I'm like, what the... What just happened? Like, wh- what is happening? It's so fucked up. They are totally messing with his head. They know that's what they're doing. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, very hard. This, this whole film is just a collection of atrocities. I mean, you've got uh, obviously the burning and torching of of the shed. You've got the rape scene. You've got the massacre of Fiora's family. You've got the burning of his father. You go on and on and on and on. I mean, I and I want to. Uh, I want to sort of step back from this movie for a second and say, what is the thesis? What is this film telling me? Is this film simply telling me that war as hell and all of these atrocities work to support this thesis? Or is there something more going on here? Um, maybe something that's even detached from war. Like, is there is there something that, I, I mean, hopefully... We'll see where the country's heading. But hopefully none of us will ever have to witness any of these atrocities. So none of this really will affect us personally. But, uh, like, I'm wondering if there's still something that we can learn and that we can sort of broaden this out rather than just simply saying, well, here's another movie about how war is hell. Like, what what is your what is your reaction to that? Am I the only one who's sort of struggling with this is just a depiction of war or what? No. Uh, so uh, one of the main things that uh, I took away from this upon seeing it the second time, I had just recently watched the documentary Night and Fog, done in 1955, 10 years after all of this went down. And it was the first real Holocaust uh, documentary that was ever made. It was 30 minutes long, and the narrator and writer of the narration over the really horrible images of what happened to people in the concentration camps, which are very well known now, but were not well known then. Um, The narrator was discussing, uh, as a survivor himself, um, his main fear. So not only were you seeing all these images, and not only was he talking about what had happened, but he talked about his very real fear at the end. And his real fear was that the people that did this to him and his people are everyday people. They're us. And his fear was that it could happen again. And so the ending, and I can never do it justice, so I won't even try to say exactly his words. Please go watch Night and Fog. It's a fantastic documentary, only 30 minutes of your time. Listen to what he says at the end. Um, We do have to worry about ourselves becoming monsters and those around us becoming monsters. And one of the things he also points out is a lot of those monsters who did atrocities to people and who were racist as all holy hell, they didn't get in trouble. They got away with it. And they could be a person at a shop that you run into. They could be the people that you interact with on your everyday basis. They could be people that killed Jewish people and, and, oversaw all this stuff or reported neighbors or whatever the hell they did because this was in 1955 so very close to when it happened you could be running into those people they're selling you bread they seem like a nice guy but they actually were really horrible monsters at one point in time and and he tried to explain that we are the monsters and we talk about this all the time on our show the monsters in the movies whether they're vampires or frankenstein or whatever They're a reflection of us. They're a reflection of humanity and what we can become based off of things that we've gone through or based off of things that we've been brainwashed to do or even just based off of what happens to our brains. It's scary. It's scary what we could do to others. And um, so even if something is based off of real life, um, it still can be in a way a monster movie, right? Like it still can feel that way. I mean, even when you have the scene where Fleora goes to the burnt crisp, like father figure, it I, I was like, is he dead or not? It felt like um, in Pet Cemetery 
with Pascal, <laughs> or I, I can't remember his name because the little girl says it funny in the in the film. But he's dead, but he's talking to her and telling her what happened and warning her of the future. And um, I, I was sitting through this scene and I was like, is this person dead or not? Is this person actually talking? Is this like a ghost thing? Is Fleora like seeing things? Because we can't trust Fleora's uh, perspective all the time in this film, obviously. Um, we, we talked about Chris Wells' uh, analysis of this, where you see his perspective. It looks like he's looking face on. Um, what, I can't remember her name now off the top of my head. Glasha. Glasha. Because uh, I'm going to talk about Glasha a lot in a moment. Yeah. Okay, good. Then this will be perfect. Uh, it, obviously, I'll let Ben talk after me, and then we could get into her. Um, but they were facing each other, and then later you see that she's not facing him at all, and she's off this way, and he's this way, and it's you can't trust his perspective or what he hears the whole time. So um, I, I found myself very confused at times when watching this, going, is this actually happening? Is this actually being said? Is he hearing voices? Like, um, and, and this is uh, this is definitely touched upon, as Chris Well also pointed out, in Alfred Hitchcock's films, um, where you have someone's voices in their heads going, in, uh, and you're like, is, is that an actual someone talking to them? Are they going mad? I don't know. That's really good storytelling, though. When you almost feel like you're going mad. It's one of the reasons why I loved Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, honestly. Because when I watch it, I feel like I am on drugs as well. I'm like, what is happening? Holy crap, this is insane. So um, it's, it's a really good storyteller, a really good director that can piece these things together where you start to question yourself and question your own sanity and question what's going on in your own mind. Um, so it, I, I feel like this is one of those stories that, um, it makes you go mad too. It, uh, I, I feel like I went through something watching this film. I feel like I sat through a thing and they were trying to warn me of something. And I saw a, an interview with the director and he said the reason why he felt it was absolutely necessary to make this film, the Cold War was going on, and he was so worried that it could happen again. And he felt it was necessary to put this film out so that it won't happen again. Maybe someone will hear his story and hear the stories of all these people that survived this massacre and maybe we can just be better people. And I feel like today more than ever, we need the story told. Now, it, when this movie came out, it wasn't really shown, shown in the West and the version that was shown was very censored. Um, and not until recently was it available to people in the West uh, in its full version. And um, I think it needs to be told. You guys need to watch this film. Be prepared mentally but you guys need to watch this film because it's warning us of things that could happen and possibly will happen. And you need to know how easy it is for us to fall into the trap. So. Um, I think, yeah, go ahead, Ben. I think, yeah, with, um, with the, the subjectivity of the shots, I think like the real utility of that besides being super interesting is the fact that it makes it somehow really, really effective at I think um, causing you to empathize with what's going on in the film. Like that's that's sort of the magic I think of taking those that I don't even want to call I don't want to call it a trick because it's not a trick. It's a technique. It's a filming technique, and emphasizing the subjective experience I think of the main character in such an extreme way in such an intense way enhances your ability to empathize with what's going on to them and so like i think that's probably why it seems more important and more significant more impactful and that something is trying to be communicated to you because it i think it clearly is just if we just look at the the film from a technical standpoint but at the end um we do see that that sort of progression of like the different shots and stuff like that the the images and the photos and there is sort of like a um, kind of like a monologue that goes on there. But we also have this image of like the baby Hitler or whatever. And I I probably need to go back and watch this scene again because I feel like 
just just reading it through subtitles makes it a little bit harder i think to comprehend and um if i were to be able to understand the russian language obviously i think it would it would it would come it would be communicated more naturally kind of like what that that key sort of closing up tying up um message was but um kind of like in my sort of like shallow i guess initial understanding of that i do think the the whole point of that is to sort of emphasize exactly what you're saying is that you know this this sort of extremism and this this inhumanity and monstrous behavior can come from anywhere um and it's just sort of like the circumstances i think of people's lives and like of a culture that sort of like caused this to happen and and sort of catch fire and and burn eventually out of control and i i don't even want to say that you know it's necessarily in this day and age it's something that you know we have to be vigilant for and watch out because it could happen well i mean there are examples of it that have happened in this country um over time and i think it's it's a mistake to try and like de-emphasize the fact that we we have and in a few different points become quite dehumanizing and almost radicalized against different groups of people. Going back to the movie, Ben, you brought us to the the final sequence, which I think is a masterfully interesting, masterfully shot, and a, a deeply interesting uh, sequence. And to sort of sum it up for our viewers, um, at the end, Fiora shoots a photo of Hitler, and we sort of see a reversal of the events leading up to the war, but then footage of Hitler moves forward, and then he shoots again, reversing other sequences, and Hitler moves forward, and again, and again, and again. Like, this this happens, I think, five or six times. Now, I as I... That was, that was a profoundly disturbing sequence, and a profoundly affecting one because it left me with as noah likes to say a stone in my shoe because i was wondering if that sequence was implying that hitler's eventual rise was inevitable or that it was uh as you were saying shayra that this was that this was an expression of how hitler can just come from even a small innocent looking boy i mean how did you respond to this which I think is probably one of the best sequences of the movie. How did you respond to the sequence? I just want to point out, he doesn't shoot his gun throughout the entirety of this film. He has a gun on him. That, that It starts out with him digging a gun out of the sand. Now, one of the rules of film, you have a gun, it shoots. That's the, that's the rule. He doesn't shoot the gun through all yeah. of all this stuff is going on. He doesn't shoot the gun until the poster of Hitler, where it calls him the liberator. He Hitler liberates us, and he starts shooting at it. Now, it does continue to reverse until he, he gets to Hitler as a baby, and he doesn't shoot anymore. He stops shooting when he gets to the point where Hitler's a baby. Um, and it, it's an interesting thought experiment that you probably had in almost every philosophy or psychology class ever. Would you go back in time and kill baby Hitler? Everybody gets this question, right, in college. Uh, and I think that Fleora says, no, I wouldn't have killed baby Hitler. I'll stop at baby Hitler. But maybe when he was at a certain age, he was definitely killable. Uh, and, uh, he might have chosen a particular time to go back and shoot him. I don't know. Uh, but he had hope for children, but it also gives a really eerie thing of at what point are we responsible for the domino effect of our actions? And it, it's that butterfly effect, right? Uh, it's this idea of these little things that lead to big things. And there was a, a really comedic, honestly, uh, telling of Hitler's earlier life that was uh, put into a short film on Showtime. Um, and it's written from the perspective of the roommate he had in college. Um, it, it was an actual story that his roommate wrote about, um, where Hitler was antisocial, awkward, uh, and not a very good artist. He was okay. He was just not good enough. Um, and he got a lot of shit. He wasn't able to connect with other people. And he was ostracized from social groups. He acted out in ways that were super inappropriate. And he lost this friend. 
and his entire peer group and got shut out of the college and just became a nobody. Um, and we discuss this kind of stuff all the time. This is very pertinent today of people that just feel like they're ostracized and then they act out. And this is happening in America almost on a daily basis now, it seems. Yeah, a similar message is being played in in the film Max with John Cusack. Um, and it's dealing with uh, Hitler as an art student. And the film was criticized for demonizing, for not demonizing Hitler. And I actually thought that that was one of the film's strengths, that it portrayed Hitler as this socially awkward uh, douchebag who, um, if only he had gotten some encouragement from art, uh, from his art world, then he wouldn't have been a, you know, crazy, uh, you know, genocidal maniac um i yeah it's but that's it's an actual an story that is but, an autobiography written by his own roommate so i don't know how anyone could say it's glorifying anything when it's a true story that's well, actually what happened to hitler so max, i i'm mad at yeah i, I, I don't know if max, max is but uh <laughs> yeah it's i i guess it, well let's let's sort of conceptualize this and it really goes back to the father of uh, modern sociology Durkheim who basically said that the way to prevent like the 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 seeds of uh suicidal ideation or in the case of of this homicidal uh ideation are a lack of social structures and a lack of social support um he he speaks specifically of suicide, so I, but I'm extrapolating into homicidal ideation, and it has to do with lack of social support and lack of a, a social safety net. Those who have a strong safety net are less likely to commit suicide, and it could be extrapolated that those who uh, who have a strong social safety net are less likely to commit homicide. And I think that that's something that this film max the showtime series that you were uh showtime uh half hour special that you were you were referencing those are the things that we are uh that that we always go back to that if you have a strong safety net you are less likely to do this and I, and we see this in many of the mass shooters in uh the united states these days that they are always that they are often those who do not have a strong uh, they're loners. They're losers. They're the ones who have been cast aside by society, and this is their way of saying "fuck you" to society. Which, um, yeah. Do we want to continue in this vein, or let's let's sort of let's talk about some? I joy. know it's dark. I'm sorry. Let's talk. <laughs> no, I want to talk about some joyful moments, uh, and and I want to I want to talk about Glasha because I think she's a just fascinating character and i think that the first there is a long so we get the sequence where he digs the gun out we get the sequence where he gets taken away we get the sequence where he's where he's pushed uh pushed aside by the army and then we get this long ass sequence between fiora and glasha and i want to talk about that long sequence because that sequence is uh so there, um, I was considering when I was writing my introduction, I was considering saying this movie is great. It has a few of the Criterion Collection moments in it, but it's great. Um, and these are some of the Criterion Collection moments because this, this was there was a lot of stuff that happens in Criterion films happens in this sequence with Glasha. Now, tonally. I think that the, these happy sequences, and I think they're played off as happy, um, w work in a similar way as Requiem for Dreams, like we're planning for the future. Uh, like those sequences work to sort of set up this, make you feel all happy so that when you feel sad later, you feel extra sad. Um, and I think the sequences in Come and See are supposed to do the same thing tonally and structurally, but for me, they didn't work because they were so fucking sur surrealistic and they seemed out of place. They seemed not organic. Like if Nazis were coming to my village, I wouldn't be dancing a jig. Um, and I wouldn't be like kissing the random girl who came around like this. It's. 
I did you have did you have the same reaction to these moments or what was your reaction to the Glasha sequences? Um, I mean, I've got another question about this, but I'm going to turn it over to you because I was really confused. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, oh, good. I I actually would like you to say something first. Never mind. Yeah, I yeah. No, I actually I think these worked perfectly, really, um, because they were great to show the character arcs. Really, I mean, for both. And I think Gl Glasha is that how we're saying that name, Glasha? Uh, That's how I'm saying that. Okay, name. <laughs> we were in Glasha. Whatever. My my bastardization of these names. Uh, sorry, guys. If you if you actually speak Russian and <laughs> can hear how horribly this is being pronounced. Um, I, I think it's great, and it's like it's it's kind of like both of these characters have a very sort of like parallel development, even though you don't see one and you see more of another. Um, at the beginning of the movie, obviously, Flora he he glorified the idea of going off to war and fighting, and I think he started in the point where most other war films exist, where you have this idea. It's like like I'm going to go fight for the country and I'm going to find this gun and I'm going to be this soldier and this classically heroic figure versus the tragic heroic figure perhaps. Um, and whenever he gets left behind in that camp, I think that's still where he is. I don't think either of them have probably fully yet um, a, gained an appreciation of the horrors of war. And so it's really probably still just a game for them, uh, particularly with Fleur and like he's, he's sad and he's crying um, and he tries to sort of like make friends with the other person and eventually they come to the point where they just kind of like want to go home because they're left behind anyway and they're gonna, you know, whatever. So, yeah, no, I think it's it's perfect because that sort of sets you up and shows their innocence and shows the fact that they're still on this initial kind of like foolish, ignorant frame of mind that would be classically sort of characterized as being kind of like childish to the like not really understanding what's going on. And then obviously that sort of transitions into the point where they do go back to the village and then shit really starts to hit the fan. Um, or like, I guess, like on their way, obviously, you have sort of like the bombings and some, like you know, whatever is happening. They're trying to leave the forest and then, you know, bombs fall from the planes and you see things exploding. And it sort of like slowly starts to transition from there into sort of their descent. But yeah, I mean, from from that point, I think it's perfect. I think it is absolutely perfect to show that these characters, here's their starting point. Here's their point of innocence. Here's the point from which they will start to go downhill. Um, and that's kind of like how I saw those. Yeah, I I had a very similar uh, experience with this. Um, I think it was ex expressing that these are children um, and that they are not really on the up and up on what love is or what settling down is, but they're trying to plan for their future. And I, I know this is going to seem out of left field but it kind of reminded me of Forrest Gump when Forrest and Bubba are talking about the shrimp boat and all the shrimp foods and all the stuff that they're going to do in the future not knowing that they're about to go through a really horrific experience in war and that he would lose Bubba um, and that there wouldn't be a shrimp boat well although he did end up getting a shrimp boat but Bubba didn't get a shrimp boat um, so it's Sorry, another spoiler. God, I, I hope you guys have seen Forrest Gump. <laughs> Shoot. Um, yeah, spoiler for a 25-year-old movie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But um, but it, it kind of gave me those vibes of that innocence, of that planning. Uh, oh, we're, we're just going to be soldiers, and, and we're just going to experience this thing, and then we'll settle down, and everything's going to be great. Just wait and see. Um, and the thing is, is that is what a lot of soldiers go into the military thinking. They they start to plan for their future, plan for what they're going to do after the military. And some some of them don't get to do anything after the military. So it's but it's I I read her as being much more worldly wise than he is. And I don't know where I got that from. I think it's just her manner. She seems like she knows that some shit's about to hit this hit the fan. And I see her as being from his perspective. Um, she, I, I see her as being a person who's very beautiful and very knowledgeable because that's his perspective of this amazing person that he just met. And we're seeing her from his eyes. Uh, seeing her beauty and seeing how amazing and fun she can be. And uh, as far as like the dancing and all that, I thought it was so perfectly put there because they don't realize the shit they're about to go through. They really are oblivious. They really are. 
I think she does. And maybe this is why those sequences didn't work for me. Because I fe- I got the feeling that she understood much more than he did. Like, I, th- I agree with Ben's interpretation of those scenes structurally. And I agree with Ben's interpretation of... Um, Fiora's readings of those those scenes and Fiora's um, experience of those scenes. I think I think Ben's got it right on when he's talking about Fiora in those scenes. But Glasha, I, I, I don't. It, maybe it was her relationship to the other soldiers and the way she looked at the other sh- soldiers. Maybe it was his, her sort of taking pity on him. You know, for me, it seemed like I, I ended up interpreting those scenes through sort of a Freudian lens and and seeing her as both as sort of a conflation of Eros and the death drive, that she was one who kind of understood that we were all going to die. So why not have a fucking dance a jig uh, before it all happens? And, and that was. Uh, that's how I ended up rationalizing. It, that's how I was able. But even to that is a form of innocence. Y- do you think in so? My mind. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, if you are really just like, all right, well, fuck it, we're just all gonna die. It's a lot sadder. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot sadder. It's not gonna be as fun loving as the way that she was reacting, and. Um, I think she did have a fuck it mentality. I did read that from her. And I did read that she wasn't, like, ignorant of the fact that there was shit going down. But I don't think she knew at what level. I don't think she could have predicted what her ending would have been. I don't think she had any idea that something like that could even occur in the world. And maybe she was a little bit more knowledgeable. Maybe she'd already had sex with people before. You know, maybe that's something she was more knowledgeable about. Because she, I think, was a little bit older than him. Um, But... I, I don't necessarily think she could have ever predicted what her end would be. And in that respect, she was innocent until the end. And um, so, yeah, she may have been a little bit more knowledgeable than him, but I don't think she still was that knowledgeable until that moment at the end. And so um, it's hard to know how fucked up human beings can be till you've been through certain experiences. And she hadn't had that experience yet. So I think she was still pretty innocent up until the end and uh as far as like the the their meeting i mean they first saw each other but their meeting was super important to me because it started out with her crying hysterically into her own hair and then he's crying hysterically and then it turns into hysterical laughter and then just maniacal crazy laughter i feel like that was them experiencing uh different versions of holy fuck we're about to we're about to go through it and his was i thought i was going to be a man finally but i'm not yet right and he wanted to be a man she on the other hand is like we're about to see some shit go down i don't know if i'm mentally prepared for it (laughs) and she wasn't right um i don't know i think trauma and the knowledge that trauma is about to hit is going to affect people in different ways. And I think it was a very realistic uh, depiction of what the fuck's about to happen. Holy shit. I think I'm losing my fucking mind. And it's, um, it's probably the most realistic part of the film when they start laughing together. Um, I don't know. It's, it's weird. It's so, it's such a weird sequence though. It really is. I mean, that's why I saw it as surreal. Ben, what about this? Uh, do you see a Freudian interpretation in this stuff? I mean, you're our resident uh, doctor of psychology. He doesn't actually have a PhD, but that's okay. I do not have a PhD, no, just a master's. And it's definitely in clinical psychology, so I wouldn't know if I'd be the Freud guy anyway. That being said, um, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I, I do see it that way. Um, yeah, I... Honestly, like uh, I, I see significance in the fact that she does seem a little bit more mature and a little bit hardened. I don't think it's to the point of being like um, kind of like an archetypal sort of like female figure for him. I don't think he sees her as being a replacement for his mother or his mother or anything like that. Um, but it is kind of interesting that she has this sense of like like authority. For instance, you know, he he was told to 
shoot anyone who sort of like walks by. He's supposed to, he's sitting there on guard duty and he's supposed to shoot anyone that doesn't stop or offer the password. Right. Um, the very next person that walks by is her and he tries to act all hardened and like, you know, is yelling at her to like say the password and she just blows by him. Like she doesn't even care. Like, it, you know, she's like what she insults him. Like she's like, whatever, stupid or like something, don't be an idiot or, or something like that. And so whenever you kind of like see her attitude, like not only do you see his still unwillingness to pull the trigger, which is very key, he's still not willing and able to do that. He's not a real soldier yet. She seems like she is more authoritative than him because she's able to push him around because she's used to being around old other soldiers. So I think I definitely see like how you can get this sense from her character and her psychology from things like that. Um, but yeah, I don't necessarily see it as being like Freudian or, or her being kind of like more to the level that we sort of like see people being tempered and hardened and absolutely destroyed like by the end of the movie. Like maybe she does have a little bit of a leg up on him, but in the grand scale of the film, it's not that much. Sure. So I, I was the only one who saw this Eros death drive thing. That's that's OK. I'll be <laughs> I'll be alone on my Freudian island. Uh, yeah. And, and to be clear, I wasn't necessarily thinking that this was uh, Oedipal or anything like that, but just the you idea of. <laughs> no, I, I don't see it that way. I was just I was referencing Freud's idea of de- Eros versus death drive. And I thought that, that was. Would she, she represented like both ends of those poles in one person, um, at least in those sequences, at least for me. That's what I was reading out of it. But um, uh, let's in, in, in a, as a whole, like her character to some degree represents escapism from war. I mean, those were the only moments when we get any kind of respite from the atrocities or the coming atrocities, even in the scene where he is enlisted in the, the army, um, his mother is screaming. And, uh, of course we know that I, I at least kind of guess that his mother probably wouldn't make it to the end of the movie. Um, and, and this theme of escapism, I think is really interesting because there's a moment where his burned father says, don't, dig as though him digging the the weapon out of the sand is the inciting incident for the film and immediately after that fiora tries to bury his literally bury his head into the mud and it seems like this film is portraying uh you know war as inescapable not only are we helpless but we can't escape it even by digging our our head into the sand or into the the muck. And of course the villagers raise his head out of the muck as soon as he does that. I mean, it's the the whole thing is about the inescapability of war, at least in, in even these sequences, because we get the, the, um, the, the airplanes above while they're, uh, having their little foray, um, and and I yeah I mean that was one of the things that I left those sequences with even though I'm still kind of iffy on those those moments. Well, she she definitely represented escapism in that the the point where they actually had conflict with each other was when she was trying to tell him your family's freaking dead, all their bodies are piled up back behind this building, your twin sisters, your mom, all of them dead. And he was, like, very angry with her. And it's not because of him necessarily, uh, you know, being mad at her. She was meant to be escape, and she was not escape anymore. She was no... And then he started to try to strangle her because her, his escape was gone. And, um, and, and that is one act of violence he definitely partook in. He may not have shot anybody, but he tried to strangle her for telling him the truth of... The outcome of his family so i found that extremely interesting and it did show that she was his escape that's why the ending is so brutal when he sees her in the manner she's in she is no longer an escape at all there's no way there is no escape all escape is gone this is your world now hey, so what's the point i Unless you want to say something about Glasha, then I want to talk about this German scarecrow that they make. Uh, yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
because this is this is another criterion moment uh the thing that only happens in criterion movies uh they take a skull uh presumably a dead german soldier a german um peacoat and uh they encase the skull in mud and uh cut off fiora's hair uh put that on the the now mud mud caked skull and it's essentially a scarecrow is this plot sequence like symbolic is this supposed to represent something um or is this sort of a literal thing that russians did to scare the german officers like how do you read this entire scene because a great deal of time is devoted to the sequence so is and and this uh this filmmaker is definitely um ilham Klimov is definitely a careful filmmaker so he's devoting a lot of time to this but i'm not necessarily sure what he's trying to do with this sequence um the way i read it and this could be completely off but the way i read it was uh based off of their dialogue they were talking about the different stds that this guy has and they were putting uh human aspects to him that is how they see this monster i think it was a coping mechanism to try to deal with the fact that these guys are monsters and i think it was uh, a doll that represented what they thought and and how disgusting they think these people are um so I, this I, goes back I know it's very dehuman. literal but <laughs> so this goes back to the dehumanization theme that we were talking about earlier about how this is literally attempting to dehumanize the nazis which that makes sense what about you ben do what was your reaction to this sequence yeah so i i had a little bit of a different interpretation on this and i i actually i found this this quite difficult like i i've been thinking about it for a little while because i knew obviously we were going to discuss it and like even while watching this i felt like it was it was pretty it was an interesting choice right like i mean as you said they do dedicate a lot of time to introducing the skull on the stick with the coat and then shaping its face and over time and like over a couple of scenes that like it morphs into hitler's face and then they put the hair on it and then you know they talk about it for a while and they carry it around and like put it at this crossroads so it is really super interesting and they I, even I think... talk about what a burden it is to carry it while well, you brought that up right they even right. talk it's... about like this shit's fucking heavy why are we doing this yeah 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 um... why are they doing it <laughs> Well, I think for for like a film selection, um, I think what you said makes sense. But I also kind of like see this as from like a human interpretation as sort of like being a way to kind of like gain control or gain power over the leader of this opposing army, like the 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 main monster, like the king demon or you know whatever. Um, they they sort of like make a a straw man or like a scarecrow of him to yeah, reduce him to something that they can make a mockery of and have control over. And I think that probably goes back to kind of like the helplessness and sort of like the fact that all of these people are thrown into this war and like all you've seen so far are scenes of tragedy where people have had to pick up and cope with their families being killed and their villages being burned and their lives essentially being destroyed by this army. And up to this point, you haven't really seen them yet. You've seen the effects of them being there. And you see, obviously, like, presumably one of them who has been killed and, like, they're turning a scarecrow into it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really just sort of, like, about control and, again, trying to cope with the fact that they have no power over this army that seems to be just sweeping over their land and destroying their livelihoods and taking away their families. And this is probably a, some, like, small respite for being able to turn it into something more manageable and something that they can make a joke about. Yeah, I I mean, I think you're it it also rhymes. Like one of the things that I love about this, and we're gonna get into some of the filmmaking, some of the, the cinematography and performances. There's a there's a three well, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about two of them. Um two visual rhymes that I think are just brilliant on Klimov's part. And the first is the scarecrow visually rhymes with the the dead Russian who's holding up a sign that says, I disobeyed a German officer. Um, that Those two sequences sort of rhyme with each other. And one sort of works in 
w- one is a a sort of just completely disembodied corpse that they try to return into a body and the other is an actually freshly dead person highlighting to my mind uh the the brutality of the german soldiers like the german soldiers the one that has the freshly dead person but it's the russians or the soviets i should say who have to make a uh, a uh, a human looking thing out of a cor- uh, out of a skull another visual rhyme in this is the they do an initial shot of the soviet army um and they actually take a photo of the soviet army and that the construction of those that group of people rhymes with the construction of the german army as they're about to shoot the the barn i mean this is careful filmmaking at its finest um i'm going to run through a few of the other things that i that i noted and you guys stop me interrupt me tell me uh other things that you found interesting or if you want to comment on any of this stuff please interrupt the hell out of me and let me know um but i the filmmaking the cinematography in this thing is just fucking masterful most shots are like either singles or they're singles in pov or they're long tracking shots and what's really cool about the singles especially the ones that are in pov is that we've already talked about the subjectivity of this film but they also place the viewer in the middle of a conversation rather than an over the shoulder shot which places the viewer as observing the conversation and when we talk about how this film affects us and uh, how this film works its magic, it's this film is able to put us in the place of the characters. And one of the ways, the techniques that it uses to do that is shooting in singles instead of over the shoulders and shooting in singles in, in POV. And the long tracking shots... So the singles establish this sort of intimacy between the characters, but the long tracking shots are able to uh, to establish the scope of the tragedy and the astro- atrocity. So, and the the um, the. Un, un, it's it's uninterrupted. The, those long tracking shots are uninterrupted. They're like they're better than anything that Alfonso Cuarón has. Well, maybe not anything that Alfonso Cuarón has ever done, but they're they're better than uh, than uh, some some of the things of Alfonso Cuarón has done because they are master. It, it, it's the the unrelenting nature of war that's being established by those long tracking shots. So I, I really want to talk about the technique of this film. Do you guys want to stop me at any point with this? I actually, I know that Ben wanted to discuss a little bit about this in some respects, but I, here's here's the thing that's very fascinating about it, and I, and I want Ben to like jump off of this. Uh, this film did not feel like it was made in 1985 at all. It felt very new. It felt very now. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that a lot of people today are using some of these techniques. Um, One of the things I do on my Instagram when I talk about the movies that I've watched, watched, I purposely try to find shots from the film where someone is looking straight onto the camera, where there's an intimacy, where the eyes are going into you and getting into your soul. And it's because those are those moments. Those are those raw moments in a film, it's really hard to find some of those shots in films. There are some films I can't find them. Um, but this but film, this film is almost 100% composed <laughs> of those shots. Right. And it's that's super modern, though. A lot of people are turning to that now in films. And um, also the long shots, like you said, uh, with with the the fogs and the mists and then it tracks over here and oh look there's some soldiers over there and they and they they got some pigs oh let's pan over here close up oh there's a guy with this weird looking panda monkey little hand thing on top of his shoulder and he's nuzzling it like it's so cute oh little pet uh, let's kill all these uh these people in the barn oh my cute little pet and you're like what the hell is happening you know then you pan over you get a, a woman eating some decadent food and then you pan over there's fire and people screaming all in the background this entire time it is uh, a pure work of art but i also notice this is in a lot of modern films today and ben i don't know if you want to talk about 
uh, the the modern elements to this, but it did feel like it was made recent in my mind. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely agree with that, and um, it's it's interesting to me because obviously this is like a, a Russian film, and I, I I do want to distinguish that because I think a lot of the films that we were seeing from the '80s out of Hollywood, you know, it doesn't feel like any of those, right? So it's like I, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a product of that because it's sort of maybe a different circle of directors or like a different ecosystem within which this film would be developed i haven't seen a lot of russian 80s films either to like compare to this to so it's sort of hard to say where this is coming from but if i if i remember correctly there's there's a lot of steady cam work in this which i think is revolutionary for the time i'm not sure when that was like widely used as being kind of um a thing that films did and, and jim you might know a little bit about this actually but uh the steady cam was i mean one of the early steady cam shots was actually in a film that we covered and it's halloween uh gotcha. that was okay. uh they, i mean they've they've done tracking shots before and orson wells of course does these long un uninterrupted takes think about the uh first sequence in touch of evil so long inter uninterrupted takes uh, or uh, uh were common even in the 1940s but this is uh alfred hitchcock's rope was 100 percent one take which is right. so amazing please check that out if you want to see a real long shot <laughs> yeah i mean there's so they but the actual steady cam which refers to a particular type of tracking shot and uh, that that was started in uh 1970s and obviously okay. used well in this one as well okay sure so all right so a little bit of film history then so like there are techniques that are already around that are being used here i mean like what is it really that feels so modern about this i don't know like you, you were talking about how the characters look at the camera um and it it really does sort of play up on the subjectivity and i think that's that we talked about that a little bit earlier about how they use these sort of like I mean, subjective perspectives. I'm going to interrupt you and, and fact check myself real quick. Steadicam is a brand of camera stabilizer. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not necessarily a technique. It's a brand of camera stabilizer made in 1975 and then used in Halloween 79. So I, I didn't want to fact check myself. Please go ahead, Ben. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. So it's still, it's still relatively new that at the time, maybe like five or six years old that people had been using this. Um, all right. But yeah, like the, the subjectivity of the shots and we've been, we've been talking about that for, for quite some time now. Um, but what's interesting about this to me is that it doesn't feel like the way that it's used now. And whenever I think about this straight on camera shot, I don't, I don't generally think of horror. I think more like when a director wants to break the fourth wall and have a moment of levity or like hang a lantern on a scene or have like some kind of like a comedic effect. You see this a lot. I don't see it used in a lot of dramas or like serious films. Um, and maybe you do have examples of that too, but I think it's, it's absolutely fascinating that yes, that is something that we see now in a lot of television and a lot of movies where we have main characters or even other characters directly making a connection and making eye contact with you presumably like seemingly um it just doesn't it doesn't feel the same though and they're using they're using it in a totally different way um and also like a, a sound design on this right so again uh another way that subjectivity is used here is the fact that you you hear things that are specific to this main character and and whenever you have a bomb go off and you have this high pitched squeal that is, is what Floria is hearing because he's going deaf. Like he's got tinnitus now or something, you know, um, or just like the muted sounds that happen whenever he's focusing on his father's words and the sounds of the crowd sort of fade out and you don't hear that. You just hear his father saying something like, I told you not to dig. And that's what he's focusing on. And that's his experience. Um, you know, I, I don't know a lot of older films that use some of these, um these techniques and like maybe that's my own limitation on the films that i've seen but it seems like they combine these in a way that is just astronomical and maybe maybe it's more than that maybe maybe it's not just the sum of the parts that are present here i i just i don't know a lot of older films that feel the way this one feels i just something about the way the techniques are used i think just sort of shines above any other examples of 80s films that i can i can readily think of or or earlier yeah, I mean, you brought up the sound design, Ben. I think, go ahead, Shayra, did you want to add something? I just wanted to say I've watched a shit ton of older films, and I agree with you. So you don't need to watch all the films that Jim and I have. You've 
noted something uh, that is it, it's it's a good observation. It's a very good observation. I want to just put that out there. Very <laughs> very good job. I don't know if it means anything coming from me, but I'm I'm telling you, it's it's great observation. Um. Yeah. Let's. I I agree. <laughs> <laughs> like retweet what Shaver said. Uh, but uh, even in the happy moments, there isn't a tonal... You you talked about the sound design. Even in the happy moments, except for the jig that she dances, where you get this kind of uh, sort of circus music that accompanies it, there isn't a tonal shift in the score. There's still a foreboding score over those scenes between Fleur and Glasha. And I thought that's fantastic. Uh, like, that's a really good use of, of score and sound. Um, this, I, we talked about those joyful sequences, like every moment of good fortune in this movie, getting the cow, stealing the cow, then the cow is killed. Every moment of good fortune is followed by bad fortune at every stage, which just continues this theme now I mean, I mean this is how the structure of the plot uh re-emphasizes the incredible unrelenting horror of war that these characters are exper experiencing and let's talk for a moment about the performances i mean we've already sort of heaped praises on young uh alexei kravchenko um, she, he's fantastic in this movie. Like, all of the performances are just on point. Even the person who plays the Soviet Commissar looks exactly like I would imagine a, a Soviet Commissar looking. Uh, like, these, it, the performances are fantastic in this. So, technically, this film is fantastic. Um, do you want to add anything before we wrap up? Yeah, uh, I, I think I know why the actors did so amazingly. Um, one of the backstories of how they made the film was that the the main guy, and I don't know how to say his name, but the main guy who wrote um, the compilation of stories of the actual events that occurred from survivors, according to their storytelling, um, he, he got three other historians, they went around the area, talked to survivors, wrote down their stories, turned it into a book, and that book uh, helped put together this film and he helped write uh co-write the the screenplay but also was there on set and he would sit the actors all down and read to them out of this book and talk to them about these experiences so that they knew the atrocities there i i feel like he was putting it in their minds that they were there is this alice adamovich yes yes okay so he was very much wanting them to understand, um, first off, the director and him wanted this to be as realistic as possible. And they saw this as um, it needs to be <clears throat> the most truth it could possibly be. Otherwise, they are slandering the, the people that this happened to. So it was very important to them that it was extremely accurate which is probably why they used <laughs> real bullets <laughs> screaming yeah. over a child's head. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's be honest. But um, so it, they did go through a lot to try to make this as realistic as possible. Uh, they, there really were people crammed into that building together. Um, and they were told the stories of how these people died. And by the way, these were their, these were their actual ancestors that this had recently happened to. It's very horrific stuff. So much so that, when these uh, this film was put up, uh, there were regularly ambulances that went to the theater houses to help out people who were passing out and having panic attacks because it was very still close to their heart that this happened to their family members. So um, I, I know it was meant to be realistic and it was portrayed as realistic and they achieved that realism. And uh, and it, it's it's an amazing piece of art and an amazing piece of history. Let's go ahead and wrap up then. Uh, ben, do you want to start us off? I know what Shara is going to rate this. I know what I'm going to rate this. You're a little bit of a mystery. I'm, I'm curious. I know you're going to be high, but uh, I'm wondering if we're reaching Seven Seal territory. Jim, that's that's an astute observation. I am, in fact, going to be quite, quite high uh, during this this explanation. No, no. Um, I... Uh, I, I think I'm aligned with you guys. I don't necessarily know that it's going to reach 
the transcendent levels that that Ingmar Bergman uh, achieved in the Seventh Seal, but and it as you've mentioned already, like this this film seems to be just technically technically I I can't find any flaws with it. It seems it seems absolutely incredible from that from that perspective. Um, they do things that I I don't think that I've seen in other films. Again, like talking about how the subjectivity and like looking at the film like none of it seems cheesy you know what i mean it's like whenever i see whenever i see other people trying to use some of the techniques that i see in this film and their stuff it seems cheesy and it doesn't work i don't know how they pulled off the incredible perspective taking that you have here in such a way that it allows you to feel the empathy and really understand the impact of the experiences that these characters are going through i i have no idea how they did that so well it's it's magic it really is a, a form of magic to be able to capture that i think in those techniques so high praises from me from just the way that was that it was designed from just the shots that they had to the the sound uh, the sound engineering to the acting um, and how realistic the transformations of the characters and how well the emotions were portrayed it was unbelievable absolutely unbelievable from that perspective and I even see this as being an incredibly important film because it has a message here that is timeless and cyclical and important um, going back to all the discussion that we had about extremism and uh, radicalization and how it can come from anywhere. And you, you need to be ever vigilant of, of this force that can rise up within your culture and take hold and cause these, these sort of atrocities and these, these human, um, this human evil. Um, that's actually something really interesting, but I, I, a quote that um, comes from John Stewart is that, you know, true evil, I think, is, is very rare. But it can happen. And I think the way that we see it historically is through people dehumanizing others and eventually coming to a point where they are able to to commit these sort of monstrous acts against each other. So, I mean, just being able to capture that and to raise a flag against that kind of thing obviously makes this film culturally important. And they even do it in a way that I think is is perfect because they don't glorify the war. They don't glorify the battle or the violence. They try to use fear to make you have the appropriate reaction to it, which is extreme aversion and awareness and a, a healthy sort of like caution against the forces that would drive you into thinking that doing this kind of shit and like getting involved in these kinds of wars or dehumanizing other people for any purpose is a good idea. It's a, a masterful application and a relevant and important application of fear, which I think obviously makes it fantastic if you want to think of it as a genre piece for horror. Um, so all around, I mean, yeah, like it, it there, there's nothing really bad I can say about this, except that I, I don't think it's still Bergman for me. It's not. It's not like it's not transcendent in that way. But damn, it's close. Like it's it's super close. I don't know if I can give it higher than a four point five, but it might it might really be like a four point seven five. You can give more than one five, Ben. I don't. I don't you know that I can. No. I, I, I I I still you. didn't. I I didn't have the same reaction to this one that I did in staring death in the face and what Bergman served up. I, I think this one is super important and I understand why it's part of the Criterion collection. Um, I, yeah, I don't know, like maybe like 4.75. Like, I, I think that's, that's really where I'm going to land on this one, guys. <laughs> oh, we don't do 0.75s on this podcast. Go ahead, Shara. Give it your, give it your five out of five. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know my rating, uh, and, and obviously it's it's also my my choice that I made. But also, um, I wanted to give a hard hitting one as we're getting near the end of uh, all of our movies that will compete against each other. And I knew this one was a hard one. Um, tease for our bracket challenge. Tease for the bracket challenge. Um, but I, I also think that it is important to incorporate a war movie within the horror genres. Um, it is un it, to understand that. But um, I want to read some Bible verses. I know that sounds crazy coming from me. Uh, but the initial title of this film was supposed to be Kill Hitler. And they were like, no, you can't call this film Kill Hitler. Although it makes a lot of sense when you see the ending sequence. It's not that he's actively saying murder something. He's saying, let's make sure we don't uh, raise any children to end up like that ever again. Um but since they still did not okay it, uh, it ended up being called Come and See. And I wanted to read the verses where Come and See came from. Uh, it comes from Revelation chapter 6, verse 7 through 8. And when he had opened the fourth seal, 
I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And they decided to name the film come and see based off of that verse. And it makes so much sense to me that they would find the end times uh, versus a descriptor of what occurred. And when you look through this film, it looks like a dystopian film. It looks like those zombie apocalypse types films. Uh, everybody around you looks like a, a, a corpse that's just like, uh, uh, what have I been through? They're all tore up and everything is destroyed. And um, one of the things that's interesting about what happened in Belarusa, as well as what happened, and I'm really glad Ben brought it up, what happened when we dropped the bombs in Japan, um, you can still see visualizations of the scorched earth from space in those areas. That's how brutal it was, what happened to Belarusa. So, um, and it didn't involve a nuclear weapon. It just involved scorching the earth and lighting people on fire. 678 villages lit on fire. Um, it is a testament of what we are capable of in the negative way. And it is one of the most horrific films I've ever seen. It takes away the agency, which we've talked about. That's a big thing for me. Uh, it is beautifully shot. It is every single sequence is, is amazing to look at and important to look at. It's something I continue to uh, learn something from every time I watch it. It sits with me forever. Um, so yeah, this is a five out of five for me. Uh, we've said so many things already, so I, I think it's just obvious where I was going with it anyway, but I guess we'll go on to Jim. <laughs> yeah, um, I, what more can I say? I mean, this film is so technically brilliant, man. It's just so well shot and so well acted. Now, I said in, in my introduction, I talked about how there were two ways a film could affect me. Like one was that it would be personally effective, like Annihilation, and it would be technically brilliant. And this film is so technically brilliant that it feels like it does both. And yeah, it does. It feels like it does both for me. It feels like this is an intimate personal journey that I've been on, and it's also so well directed. I mean, I, but I keep going back to how it is, for me, it primarily a technical achievement. And, uh, you know, there's, there are a couple moments of the surrealist sequences that didn't necessarily work for me as well as they did they did for others. And, you know, Ben kind of tried to try to talk about how those fil those sequences worked for him. Overall, though, I love this movie. I am so happy that Shayra uh, brought it to me, but I am going to go with a 4.5, even though I did extort Brad to try to give another 5. Uh, that's only because he's literally only given one 5 in the history of the podcast. But at uh, 4.5, 4.5, and a 5, this literally puts the film number four on the history of the Deadly Analysis podcast. Uh, 4.67 is the average. That is uh, that is the fourth highest that we've ever done on this podcast. So this will be this will be seated rather highly when we do our uh, bracket challenge, uh, which we will. We're, we're going to be rolling details about that out um, as time goes on. Um, we are only three weeks away from finishing the 64 films, and then we'll give you more uh, more details about that. Be sure to watch our social media at Deadly Analysis on Twitter, and also watch our website where we're going to post the bracket on the website, and uh, we'll give you more details about the bracket challenge. Thank you again for joining us on the Deadly Analysis podcast. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and uh, hit us up on social media, and uh, we'll see you next week. Have a good night.